use this Windows 7 machine with two gigabytes of RAM. All right, and I know this is currently used by Black Hats to take down real servers, and it affects basically anything that uses TCP. He's not joking. It's not, this is not a bug. This is not a zero-day flaw you can fix. This is in the design of TCP. However, as usual, it's in the implementation that the suffering comes up. So let's get um, Task Manager running here so you can see how burdened my Windows 7 target is. So you see here the CPU is down to 0%. The um, memory being used is about half of a gig, and I got one and a half gigs just sitting there empty. So this server is not heavily burdened at all right now. Now, in order for this thing to run in Slackware, you have to do two things. Let me just show you this. You have to attack many open ports on the server, and you have to attack them from many sources. Now, you could go get a botnet or something, but you don't even have to. You can fake a botnet. You can send packets that come from multiple local source addresses, and you can get them from DHCP, as long as you have something that will answer fake DH with fake DHCP replies. Now, the original designer of the tool wrote a tool to do that, and I could not make it work, so I wrote my own. Um, which is not hard at all, it's just a scapey script. It's artpoi, so I do just do cat artpoi2 is the one I'm using. And I made it even simpler a couple days ago. There, there it is, I don't know if I make this bigger, shift, shift control plus, no, okay, not in Slack right. Anyway, it's just a few lines here and it's on my, my page. All this does is listen for ARP requests and give you an ARP reply. Um, always giving it the same MAC address. So my machine can have many MAC addresses. This is really important because you have to attack from many IP addresses and if you attack from the main IP address that the machine is really using, you will kill the attacker too. The attacker is not protected in any way from this attack. The attacker is using TCP. So you can kill your attacker while you're killing the target if you don't do it this way. So what you do is you have a real IP address that you're using for communications, and then you have a whole slice 25, 128 fake IP addresses, which you're sending packets out from there, but you're not actually letting the operating system know that you're making TCP connections there, so it does not burden the Slackware operating system with maintaining those half-open connections. Anyway, let me run this thing. It's start ARP. Okay, now I've got the fake ARP thing running. Now I'm gonna start the attack, and this should be good, clean fun. Um, Sock. I made a script called Sock that starts the attack. All right, there you are. So now it's sending 2,000 connections per second. The CPU is up to 100%. The RAM use is increasing. And if you look at the ARP, the ARP, uh, yeah, it should be showing a bunch of resolutions there, but maybe it's already remembering them from before because I suspended this machine right after a long attack. Anyway, this is doing just what it should. So on the right is the attacker sending three or 4,000 connections per second from a model in 28 source ports to about 10 destination ports. I got about 10 listening services on that machine, FTP and Telnet and a web page and all that jazz. And uh, all right, I guess nothing important died there. So now we're up to 900 megs. And you can see in this candy little graph as the RAM is just going up and up and up. And this may not be exciting enough. We may just let this go for a while and come back to it. But the interesting thing, I'll just tell you the punchline is, you can run that RAM as high as you want until the machine crashes and dies, and when you stop the attack, the RAM never comes back. It's permanently in use, it's an implementation error, it is waiting for, it's storing something in RAM that it's ready to deliver to the other machine, and it's waiting, and the window size is zero or four, so it can't actually send it. And it's just filling that all up in RAM, and when you drop the connection, it never comes back. So this is something that could be patched, on that side. Anyway, um, I was not able to break this machine to where it wouldn't even boot, but I am able to freeze it so nothing works on this end. When it starts running out of RAM, it's just gonna go crazy. It's kind of good, clean fun. I'm gonna leave it go in the background, may come back to it. Um, but it's kind of fun when it gets all the way up. Yeah, let me just wait. We're already up to 1.2. Thought it'd go pretty fast. Um, when it gets to the top, you can watch the server die. It starts squirming around like a worm on a hook. Yeah. So while we're waiting for this. Yeah. Have you ever tested this against, say, a VMware ESX box with multiple hosts? No, I would be very nice. You want to test it against an ESX box with multiple hosts? I didn't, but of course, the real black hat that convinced me to do this is doing that all the time. That could be really 
it takes down everything, according to him. And as far as I can tell, he's right, because I made nothing special. Now, when I first tried it, I was having lots of trouble with the slackware and everything, and I made a special weak host that only had 5, 12 megs of RAM. But yesterday, it worked so well. I said, what would happen if I made a real host with 2 gigs? And man, it works just fine. As far as I can tell, it doesn't matter how much resources you have at this end. It's just using them up, and it's going to die a gruesome death. It's kind of fun to watch it croak and die up there, although I wasn't able to render my virtual machine unbootable. But what he tells me is this attack is not for wimps. You have to take over a server to do this attack, and a real server running something sensible like Slackware, and then you have to really run, send some powerful series, a bunch of connections from it, and then he says you can kill machines so they can't boot up again. Now, what I assume is going on there, I'm just guessing, is you're freezing the machine so badly that it needs a hard power off and a hard power on, and that will often make servers unbootable. That's all I'm thinking. I can't imagine it could do anything more than that. But anyway, we're nearly up to the part where the server will start being fun to watch here. 1.7 gigs. In fact, it's already stopped updating Task Manager, I believe. It looks to me like Task Manager has frozen here. And if I, yeah, yeah, I can no longer use the mouse. Yeah, we've got a reasonably dead server here. There, it's responded a little bit to me that time. Now it's updating a little more, but notice how the nice smooth progress is beginning to fall apart here. And yeah, now it's going to start going up and down. The RAM and the CPU will both start going up and down until they go crazy on you. This is, um, this could be your server. It's a gruesome thought. And nobody's patched this in five years, so I thought it might be fun to take this to the cons and engage in the usual humiliation ritual of irritating all the vendors until somebody actually cares enough to fix it. And this is, I think, why nobody fixed it and why I didn't even know about it, because it's not that easy an attack to do. But I wrote up complete instructions a few months ago. Um, and uh, anyway, this thing, we'll come back and look at it. It's going to wave up and down and do entertaining stuff. So um, I got one other thing to show you, because there's still time, which is what I thought would happen. Um, I got another old attack. But anyway, here's some pictures from before. Let me make this big. So there it is, gradually using up. Oh, yes, yes. OK. So there it is, climbing to the sky. And when it's done, it starts freaking out on you. And I turned off the attack here, which causes the CPU to go to zero, but the RAM use just stays high forever, which is not healthy. The only thing that's going to fix this server is a restart. And uh, all right, so now. I'm always talking about IPv6 because IPv6, by the way, is more of the same. You know, IPv6 came out in 1993, and the plan was to have 100% deployment by 1999, and none of that happened, as you might have noticed. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's good. That's why I have this terse statement here. No, six is greater than four, man. There's one only one. Anyway, so the, uh, anyway, so IPv6 came out, but it, instead of being fully implemented by 1999, it's not even implemented yet. And all the stuff we're using is junk, pretty much. I don't hope the guys in Microsoft don't hit me too many times with a hammer, because they worked real hard to put IPv6 in Microsoft products. But everything we have is just thrown together hastily and not tested, and it doesn't work. And it's kind of fun to blow it away with every tool you want to try on it. And so security is a big problem. Anyway, this is why we have to do it. We're running out of IP version 4 addresses. The main reservoir ran out a year or two ago. And North America is expected to run out of addresses next year. So there's going to be no more IPv4 addresses available at all. You'll have to, you can use the existing ones, but you can't get any more. So IPv6 has a few more addresses. So I made an IPv6 exhaustion counter. This is the projected date we will run out. So upgrading to IPv6 will give us a little more breathing room here. Um, so this is the old link local DOS, the thing I showed you two years ago. And this is the old-fashioned attack. Um, now, the way this works is when you get an address in IPv6, you don't usually do it with DHCP, although you can. This is not the most common. DHCP is a pull process. The client boots up. It says, I need an IP. The router tells the IP. That's the end of the transaction. That will not happen anymore until the client boots up again or until days pass. But in IPv6, it doesn't work that way. The router just sends out periodic router advertisements and it tells everybody that can hear it, you have to stop what you're doing and join my network. Create an address and join my network. This just goes out, it's pushed out from the router. And this goes out as a broadcast packet, although it, technically there is no broadcast in IPv6. There is instead something called multicast to all nodes, which is essentially the same thing. So the router advertisement packet goes out. You can pick it up in Wireshark. And the router advertisement packet goes out to this FF02 colon colon one, which is the broadcast to all nodes address. 
and it contains a prefix, 2001 and all this hogwash, and therefore everybody that gets that packet has to join that network. And if you send out a flood of broadcast packets with random prefixes, then the um, machine has to create all these addresses, and that doesn't seem like a big problem, but unfortunately, it's quite efficient at killing Windows, because Windows, and for some reason, BSD Unix, are incredibly inefficient at creating these addresses. They can only create about five of these per second, and that uses 100% of the CPU. Don't ask me why. I've never, I can't imagine, it's got gigahertz processor, all it has to do is make one address, how hard can it be? Apparently it can be very hard, apparently it can take 200 milliseconds at full, full CPU. So if you drive this thing um, in 2011 against Windows machines, it'll push the processor up to 100% and it'll stay up there just like that sock stress is doing, the CPU will be at 100% forever. You'll have backlog of four hours before it ever comes back. So Microsoft patched it, sort of, about halfway in November of 2012 with a thing called the IPv6 readiness update. But the IPv6 readiness update is only available for Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2. For some reason, Microsoft did not patch their newest products, Windows 8 and Server 2012. Probably because they feel like it's not vulnerable. And the man that wrote these attack tools also feels like it's not vulnerable until about three weeks ago when I managed to talk to him. But I started playing with this stuff. I got a student who's an IPv6 fanatic and he and I worked forever on this stuff. We got a lab set up. so. Um, we had a real IPv6 lab really going to the internet on IPv6, and then we tried this tool. There's a new RA flood, just came out a couple months ago. Um, and all this does is use more devastating router advertisements. It turns out, I don't know why you would do this, but you can advertise multiple routers and multiple route, routing table entries in the same routing advertisement. So now every single routing advertisement packet contains 17 route um, entries and 18 prefixes. Looks like this. Goes on and on. So each one of these is like 25 or 35 of the previous ones. And then you send a flood of these out as fast as you can and it has no great effect. The, then the, and what happened is I brought my machines down. It was real dramatic. The next time I tried it, it didn't work. Then I tried to work again. I was trying to make a video and I couldn't make it hold still. And I said, what's going on? And my student said, it only works when there's a real router in the network. And I said, that's stupid. Look, a real router puts out one router advertisement every five minutes. I'm putting out a thousand per second. There is no way that one more makes a difference. You're wrong. It's got to be the cable. It's got to be the switch. It's got to be some adjustment. He was right. You have to have a real router in the network. So let me show you this one. This one's good, clean, fun. Um, well, let's just take a look and see how this thing's doing. Yeah, there it is. This CPU came down to zero finally. You know, I don't think the attack has stopped. Anyway, I'm going to have to stop this one. Oh, looks like my, whoo, looks like my attacker's not healthy. All right, anyway, rather than worry anymore about that one, let me set up the new one. And by the way, there's a fun thing to show you, and I'm glad I have a few more minutes here, because you guys are vulnerable out there. Now, in this con, unlike every other, all of you aren't sitting there on laptops, which is kind of a shame, because you could be victims without knowing it. However, somebody in this hotel is a victim, I'm not going to bring them down, but I'm going to tag them. Um, all right, let me connect to the hotel network right here. The one that worked before was ATT Wi-Fi, which I think is Starbucks, although when I had to, I had to approve, you saw me approve it on the other machine, it seems like I had to approve myself for the hotel. You can join if you like, join this network and see what happens. Um, all right, I'm on the ATT Wi-Fi network. Now, I'm going to send out some routing advertisements from here. Now, I'm going to send out um, CC5F. College IT chat, and then dude, okay, that'll do. Some kind of distinctive string here. I'm sending out a network starting with those letters. And to detect it, I'm gonna run this tool called Passive Discovery, which see when a, a computer does create an IPv6 address and join the network, it has to make sure it's not already in use, the address it created. So it has to send a, a, a neighbor discovery message out saying, hey man, I'm about to use this address. Is somebody already using it? So I just listen for those. So if anybody actually cares that I'm sending out router advertisements, they will pick it up here, and to pick up only the ones I created here, I'm gonna get the ones with CC5F in them. I guess I'll put in uh, uh, dude2. Okay, so this'll show me if there are any CCSF dudes around here. I gotta put in the right password. All right, so now I'm gonna send them out, and didn't like it. Oh, I forgot, I'm missing a colon, okay. There, now it likes, okay, there's a couple people on my network. Now, I'm gonna put this Windows 8 machine on. 